welcome to Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Nordquist. In our last episode, we discussed college education and the university experience in economic terms. Today, we'll discuss the purpose of education from a more humanistic angle. To that end, I'm incredibly excited to introduce two absolutely stellar alumni of the Madison program, Ben and Jenna Story. They are currently senior fellows at the American Enterprise Institute in the Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies Department, where they focus on political philosophy, classical schools, and higher education. Until recently, they directed the Tocqueville program at Furman University in South Carolina, which teaches philosophy and political thought. They recently co-authored a book, Why We Are Restless, and today we'll discuss how to think about restlessness and choice. Ben and Jenna, welcome back to the Madison program and to the show. Thanks very much for having us, Annika. So you've talked a lot in various places um, about the kind of student that has led you to write your previous book and that has started the work, the projects that you've been working on. Um, and so rather than asking you to just repeat it again, I thought that I'd kind of share, I feel that I'm very much the sort of person who your previous book, Why We Are Restless, was geared towards. I sort of like did all the things in high school, all the AP classes, all the SAT prep, debate team, athletics, the whole thing. And in college, some people relax. I didn't. I continued doing all the things. You know, I had done honors math, which I hate to get into Stanford. And then at Stanford, I was like getting good grades to do grad classes in order to do the honors thesis. And finally, you reach the end of the rabbit hole and you're free to do whatever you want. And you're like, actually, I don't really know what I want. Um, What I want is another hoop to jump through. And I'm realizing I'm describing my life like a pyramid scheme. But like you've encountered many kids like that. And and I want to ask you, do you think this kind of system for success that people are jumping through, jumping through all these hoops, do you think it's a problem? Do you think that people are learning good things along the way or that it sort of all in all has to be thrown out? Um, And is it wrong to do all the right things? Hmm. Is it is it wrong to do all the right things? In a way, that's that's a, this is a really good question, Annika, and, and I, I appreciate your 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 frank description of your own experience uh, with these things. I think the first thing to say to any of the younger people listening is uh, that you, of course, did not create the gauntlet of hamster wheels. Uh, you find yourselves running through. Uh, that is the creation of older people acting in response to the incentives of their lives, the um, who have uh, who have set up this kind of uh, obstacle course or um, sort of funhouse of challenges that the um, that the young find themselves uh, wandering through. I think we can take an interesting note here in terms of um, what could be what could be done about this and whether people are learning interesting things along the way. Um, Let me start with the second part of that. Of course, people are learning interesting things on the way. Um, Even if you take a philosophy class or an art history class or a uh, physics class, because it is a requirement, you may nonetheless uh, encounter an interesting and important body of material, a great professor, the, um, and that can be a really important experience in somebody's um, young life. So in this sense, it's not wrong to do any of these things. What is wrong is to orient your life in terms of the kind of checklists that are both, uh, there's, a, there's a, both a, a supply and a demand side to the prominence of those kinds of checklists. On the one hand, students want them. They want to be told what to do in order to succeed. They want somebody to give them this recipe. And that's not just students. Is it, you know, there are interesting conversations among faculty and on college and university campuses. They want the requirements for tenure spelled out exactly to the letter so they know exactly what they have to do. And, you know, both, I think, at the level of students and sometimes at the level of faculty, people are afraid of a freer system in which uh, those in positions of authority would be saying things like, do excellent work and you will be rewarded and leaving it, leaving it at that. Actually, that's the situation we find ourselves in at AEI, where we are not told how much to publish, where to publish, the, um, what kinds of events are useful, what kinds aren't. That, those judgments are left up to us. 
and it's a really bracing kind of um, experience. So people want this kind of checklist description of what they need to do to be successful in life. Um, those in positions of authority are eager to provide it because it seems like they're being a good authority when they do that. It seems like they're being fair and just, um, giving people what they ask for. But I don't think that kind of experience is actually what really helps people in the long run. So I think people provide these kinds of checklists out of a desire to say, mm -hmm. okay, well, if you do this, that, and the other thing, you will be meeting the requirements. But I think they often don't realize that what people really want out of their educations is a kind of human flourishing that cannot be created by filling boxes on a checklist. It involves a sense of directedness and purpose, which we can talk about more as, as we go on here, that is, um, is best cultivated in other ways. I want to just mention one example here that I think is illuminating before, before I see what if Jenna wants to add anything. Robert Maynard Hutchins, the famous president of the University of Chicago, uh, wanted to get rid of, and for a time did manage to attenuate, the requirement that education be structured in terms of the number of hours you sat in various classes. Um, he wanted education structured in terms of exams administered by outside parties. I think there's a similar system um, at, at Oxbridge in, in, in the UK. And so the, you know, the point there was like, look, if, if, if you understand what you would learn from an introduction to poetry class without actually sitting through the course hours, well, that's the point. And that creates something of a greater distance between the aims of education and the, the, the ticky tacky sort of requirements that are often embodied in, um, in something like a syllabus or a course of, um, of requirements for a major. And so in that sense, yeah, you know, I, I think it's going to take a lot of courage for a lot of people, uh, both those in positions of authority and the young to say, yeah, look, we're going to live in a condition of greater freedom, which also means greater uncertainty. And we have to learn to do that well, which actually doesn't just mean proliferating choices, but that's something we can talk about more as we go on. Yeah, so I might just add a couple things to what Ben said. First, about the danger of checklists. Um, also coming from uh, Robert Maynard Hutchins, he had said there's an implicit danger in setting out course requirements, which is not only that someone might need to repeat something they already know, right? Or that, uh, but, but more on the other side, that any time you set out a list of course requirements, people start to assume that if you take physics 101, 102, and 103, you'll know physics. And that's not the case. There are, it's, it's, it's not the case that if you take just a prescribed set of courses, you'll be knowledgeable in that field or competent in that field. And so it gives us a false sense of what we're actually doing and achieving. And so he's very resistant to course requirements and checklists for that reason. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add was an example uh, from recent experience in my life. So Ben and I both graduated from the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. And I was recently invited back to speak about my career trajectory well, along with another a, a number of other alumni from the social sciences division as a whole. And we were invited there by deans and administrators who are designing a career preparation program, as it were, or some kind of pathway from study to career for the graduate students there. And I think they wanted to discern from our answers, our, our stories of how we went from our time in Chicago to the various jobs we had held since then. They wanted to discern something like a checklist. They wanted to say, like, what did you have to do in order to be part, you know, attain the job that you have now that you're, that you're happy and that you feel really um, allows you to, to flourish. And the funny thing was about eight out of the 11 people who spoke said that, how did they get their job? The job was not advertised. They got the job by asking for it. So what does right. it say about checklists? So it, it was kind of disconcerting to everybody in the room that it wasn't like, well, I knew I wanted to be a doctor, that I figured out like, what I need to do to be a doctor, and then I like searched, you know, the various hospitals, and then I applied to the one that. Seemed... No, everyone had in, basically, and almost everyone had invented their job, hmm. and 
that means there wasn't really a path that you could determine in advance to get you there. Like, I want to be X and I have to step on these stones to get there. Um, and in a certain way, therefore, you know, Chicago had not had never given us checklists for this kind of thing and not prepared us in that way. But it did prepare us in another way, we all concluded, which is that the education there helped us think about what it is we wanted to do and therefore allowed us to have that kind of strong sense of purpose and strong sense of what we wanted to do in the world. And then we just went out and figured out where we could do it best. So one of the people on the panel with me was a, a, had a PhD in anthropology. He had studied the culture of uh, banks, people working in banks. And when he was done, he decided he didn't want to teach. Uh, he wasn't sure what he wanted to do. He wanted to live in London. And so he called up the head of the Bank of England. I was like, I have a PhD in anthropology, and I think I might be helpful to you. <laughs> and wow. he's, he's still there. Um, and he, he's really enjoying studying and working with the culture of people working in that bank. So I guess I, I want to press you a little bit more on this idea of academic liberty, because both of you alluded to it a lot throughout your answers. And I guess my first question, kind of at a most basic level, is are you arguing that academic liberty is a good unto itself or that academic liberty is sort of a means to an end that it enables you to kind of build the skills that you'll need to create a job for yourself to to find what you want to do and actually execute and do it uh, definitely the latter that academic uh, academic freedom is a means to an end it is not an end in itself the purpose of academic institutions is to create an environment where the pursuit of truth is paramount. Hmm. So I was an undergraduate at the University of North Carolina, and I loved the place from the moment I walked on campus. And the reason I loved it was because it accorded positions of honor, respect, uh, and, and seriousness to people who would be, frankly, despised in other social realms. It's not, it's not, in it, 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 it other words, it, it, it put at the center a certain kind of marginalized people. And, and what I mean by marginalized people in this case is guys with bad hair and dandruff <laughs> and stains on their ties who uh, nonetheless were really serious about physics and loved it and could communicate a, a, a discerning and demanding, but also passionate love of the truth to their students the uh through their um through their teaching those people are taken seriously on a university campus and the reason they're taken seriously is because they're really good at something and that something is getting to the bottom of their particular science and so in this sense uh, academic freedom the purpose of academic freedom is to allow that pursuit to go on in an unfettered and also effective way. Hmm. And so there are there are problems on both sides. On the one hand, there's lots of concern about academic freedom right now that it is being too limited and that's a real concern. We don't want to we don't want to uh, prevent people from following the truth wherever it leads. But on the other side, and actually I think working in tandem with the opposite extreme is the thought that truth is really not the subject hmm. of academic inquiry. The, um, that is, you're, there are many academics who are kind of allergic to the word truth, and this, and 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 have frankly conceded to the notion that intellectual enterprises are alternative forms of politics or power seeking, mm -hmm. and these two, these two extremes. The one that emphasizes power above all and the other that emphasizes freedom above all, both of them actually are, I think that one of the biggest problems on campus is that these two things are working, are colluding without meaning to, to crowd out the actual center of the academic enterprise, which is uh, the effort to understand the truth about the world and ourselves. Hmm. I'm really happy that you said that. That's really interesting. And especially because I guess one of the things I've been noodling on was to what extent the purpose of education, as you described it, of like hyper focusing on a particular topic intersects with something more like the British or the European system. And so you sort of answer the question before I could ask it. But that's very interesting as a response, the idea that it's not just about kind of like a checklist, a myopic focus, but it's more about having the ability and the flexibility to pursue, which the American system, I think, does have more than at a place like even Oxford. Uh, but 
I want to harp on this idea that you have about truth in the classroom, uh, because it's very much a topic of controversy and debate right now. And it seems to me that so many people, what they view the task of educating as is to confuse students. Um, and there are varying views about it. But the idea is that if you present students with a wide variety of views and you don't take a truth position, that the end goal of that is that they'll just sort of understand that there are a wide variety of views. And that's kind of the end state of affairs that we're aiming for. Um, I take it from your previous response. You do disagree with that. But I guess my question is why? And if you're not trying to kind of expand the mind by confusing people, what is the purpose of education? And is there, I, I'll add on to that, sorry, is there a role still for the process of confusion that so many professors view as their main goal in the classroom? Good. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I think confusion or uncertainty anyway is, or is almost always an important part of education. Um, you only change your understanding, you only expand your understanding when you come to realize you don't know everything already, right? So if students are walking in convinced of a certain idea, they, they may be on the right track, they may not, whatever, but they need to, they need to understand that there's, there's more to know. And so uncertainty, confusion plays a proper role in education, but to think that confusion is the end goal of education mm -hmm. is kind of right. paradoxical, right? <laughs> and so the, a, a number of people asked us a question that's somewhat similar in response to our um, New York Times piece or our book, they were thinking that the student we were describing there was actually in a pretty good place because because she didn't know what she wanted to do. Yeah. And really, it depends, right? Because it's it's often the case that you get to the end of college and you're not exactly sure what you want to do next. That's not always a bad position. The question is, how are you thinking about that? Your time in college should have prepared you to think about that well. Yeah. And you really can only tell this by engaging with a student and, and asking them to go through their you know, process of, of, of thinking about how they want to live their life, whether they're thinking about it well or not. But we were finding um, that so many students were not only unsure about the next step, but really not equipped to think about it well. And that should be the goal of education. Education shouldn't leave you just confused and dispirited, right? Um, if it does, I mean, often we are presenting students with a number of different interpretations or different ways of thinking about things or different ways to live. But the goal there should be clarifying what each of those ways is, what it entails, trying to understand how how solid the, the reasoning or the perspective behind each of those alternatives is. And so... When, when we talk about preparation for choosing, um, I guess, talk me through a little bit what that means, because it's sort of, it's a broad concept, um, the idea that you need preparation to make choices. Everyone would probably say yes, but not everyone would maybe be able to say that there's some thing that works for everyone, some philosopher or even, even some school of thought, let alone some sort of method of preparation um, that would be appropriate kind of to all circumstances. Do you, do you see any, any such thinkers or modes of preparation that you think are necessary that we're not using right now? Yeah, I think we, I think we do. I think um, one can find in pre-modern traditions, um, the thought of uh, thinkers as various as Plato and Aristotle and Al-Farabi and Thomas Aquinas. Um, arguments about the place of the various goods that human beings pursue in our lives that are concrete and definite. They're not simply open-ended. Let me give you, so in other words, I think a thinker, I'll take Thomas Aquinas as my example for the moment. I think Thomas Aquinas thinks we can know things mm -hmm. about the kinds of beings we are and the kind of goods we pursue. And we can determine whether or how much sense a certain way of life makes on the basis of that kind of assessment. But let me give you an, an example from uh, a, a phrase that I just heard for the first time yesterday that has been um, sticking in my mind. I was at an event with a number of other um, uh, college professors and they were describing a, a phrase that has caught on among their students who are saying with respect to what they want from their educations, I don't want meaning, 
I want money, <laughs> which is clever as a poke at the meaning mongering of uh, squishy, mm. expensive colleges. Right. <laughs> the, uh, you know, there's, I don't know, something particularly awful about the combination of squishy and expensive <laughs> that, um, that these people uh, uh, put forward. But what those students, it, when those students say they want money rather than meaning, what they're really saying is that they want to be miserable. Uh, mm. They may not recognize this, but this is this is a thing you can know. If you make money the end of your life, if you dedicate all of your energies to pursuing that, it will not make you happy. It is impossible because of the kind of thing money is and the kind of thing you are. The, uh, in other words, money is a means. It's I, I, I'm not opposed to money. I rather like it. The uh, but it is it is a means to other ends. So, for example, you can buy a house with money. A house is a good thing. What is a house good for? One of the th things a house is good for is raising a family. The um, and that's what we like to do in our house. And so we're glad we're able to, you know, afford one and use money for that purpose. But notice that the whole point of pursuing the money is for this other aim, and that aim is instantiating a rich and substantive life with one another and with our children. The uh, and that's you know so when people say they want money, I actually think they often mean that they want something like that. They they what what they're talking about is their desire for a um, uh, rich and uh, rich and variegated experience, and uh, which we could we could talk about the um. But they're you know they're talking about their desire to build a home, um, and those things are more noble in and of themselves. But that's the thing: if you just pursue money for its own sake. You'll find yourselves doing. Th you'll find yourself doing things that are contrary to what is actually your deeper end. In other words, if, if you know you can work, you know if you just want money, people will happily employ you eighteen hours a day in the pursuit of it. The um, particularly if you're a clever graduate of a place like Princeton, the uh, and um, you will thereby make it impossible for yourself to have the kind of rich family life that you actually wanted the money for in the first place. So it's very important for people to get their priorities correct about this, to understand that yes, money is a good, but it's a limited good. And that can that can that can have a certain place in a human life, but it can't possibly be the thing that we're seeking above all. And uh, if you can if you can understand things like this, then you know, that kind of understanding is, I think, the complement to the freedom that we began by speaking about, right? We you know, in a certain sense, Jen and I are, I, I think, arguing for a less checklisty form of of liberal education. But that's not because we think everybody should just choose their own adventure and let a thousand flowers bloom. It's because <laughs> we think that there is a certain determinate direction and content to liberal education that actually helps people choose better. That doesn't mean that I think I can just tell you. This is the end of human life. I think that is something that you have to discover for yourself. But I think it is something that teachers can help students discover by presenting them with the best that has been thought and said about these kinds of questions and let them work through the reasoning for themselves. The reasoning is very powerful if people are allowed to discover it. So I guess, and I do want to ask you more about this idea of happiness, and you've also kind of referred to human flourishing, which I think is kind of in the same category here. Uh, but just, I guess, to play devil's advocate here and maybe look at like the more charitable read of the statement that students make. Like when you say, I'm at a university because I want money, not meaning. I mean, it might not necessarily be a statement that means, oh, I don't want meaning at all. I don't want happiness. What you mean is I paid money for a university and I want to get money once I leave the university. And so it's a statement about like what you view as the purpose of the university, potentially more so than what you view as like the point of your life. And so I guess if we take that reading, what would you say your response to that would be? I think that it's a bit of a waste of your time to spend four years simply seeking a higher income. Um, it, as Ben said, income is an important thing to think about. But I'm really not sure that you need to go to all that. Waste your time, really. It's not your money. I'm more concerned about the time that people are wasting at universities if they're not pursuing um, their education in the right way. 
um, and even the deformative effects that spending that time in the, in the way that people are spending it has on their, their future thinking and characters. So I don't think you can really instrumentalize your time, four years of your very young life like that without serious consequence. Um, and I think there is, uh, I wanted to return to some things Ben was saying, if, if you don't mind, just thinking about the method of preparation for choosing. And I think this is also addressing something you were just saying, Anika, that we tend to separate thinking about how to get to, you know, uh, uh, get a major in a college or how to get the degree or how to get the next job. We make those kinds of, we think about those things in the, in the form of a checklist, as we've been saying, right? But where does meaning come from usually? Not from the checklist. None of us are thinking that. Meaning comes from kind of out there or in there, as it were. We often we say, you know, find your passion, discover your passion. What is your inner voice telling you? Look deep within, you know, something like this. So we actually don't just use the checklist method. We've been talking about that, but we combine checklists with something like an inner voice or a passion, which we don't really think has a rationale to it. Right. So we go with, on the one hand, a very rational sort of calculative form of thinking in the checklist. We combine that because we need something else, obviously, with an almost whimsical sort of intuitive understanding of what we were meant to do. Right. And I think that's what these students are reacting to in part when they say, I don't want meaning, I want money. Like you don't want to go to a college that just says, find your inner voice. Like, thanks, I can do that on my own. Right. I really don't need to, I, I literally don't need formation to do that because it's just a matter of gazing within. Um, but I think this, this combination of checklist plus, plus inner voice is really the most accurate way to describe how we're asking students to think about themselves and their path in life. And it makes an artificial separation between two things that really belong together. And when they come together, they look quite different, right? So on the one hand, we have calculative reason. On the other hand, we have something like intuition or whim. And when they come together, you get actually what Aristotle described choice to be, right? Which is reasoned longing or a longing reason. That's what he said choice was. It was a kind of combination, a mixture, a marriage of, of longing and thought, mm. right? And I, I think that's, that's where we need to get back to. And I think Ben was starting to talk about some ways that we might do that when he was making reference to Aquinas. But in our course that we ended up teaching that was meant to address this, this problem of, um, of, of choosing with our students, we actually don't begin with Aquinas. We begin with something that Ben teaches with Plato's Gorgias. Um, and, and really, you could you could probably choose many Platonic dialogues to make this point, although the Gorgias has some other features that uh, make it particularly appropriate. But the Gorgias, or Platonic dialogues in general, powerfully tell students, communicate to students, and even wrap them up in the experience of realizing that they can think about what it is they want, right? That what they want and how they think are not just two separate things that they can really reason through their desires. Hmm. And that's really the first step in recreating a, a method for choosing. Let me just add one thing, uh, Annika, if I could, to, in response to your, to your question. Listen, when, when students say, I don't want meaning, I want money, the university cues them up to say that, right? Uh, you know, the, the, these these institutions have uh, increased their prices at a faster rate than any other sector of the economy, and you know, at many places, including places we've attended, the, uh, the it now costs eighty thousand dollars a year to get a college education. So, in, in a certain sense, I understand what students are saying and how they're being driven to say that they are mirroring what the adults are saying. In other words. Another way, another way to say that would be that the, the college is saying to them, we want money, <laughs> not meeting. And they are just giving that back. Uh, and I think that's a, um, uh, and so, uh, you know, one thing I think colleges really need to, you know, Mitch Daniels, one of the things that's really admirable about this contemporary 
uh, college president, or I, I can't remember if he's actually stepped down from Purdue yet, but he's going to do so soon. So he'll be a former college president before long. But Mitch Daniels actually reduced tuition, uh, which most college presidents w- would tell you is totally impossible, that the, you know, the sky would fall if they ever tried to do such a thing. Another person that we admire, Pano Canellos, who was president of uh, St. John's College, enacted a major tuition cut the, um, there, and the, uh, and the college didn't just survive, it thrived. The, and so one thing, you know, if we want students to say less, I want uh, money, not meaning, we need to stop saying it to them, mm. that that is the most important thing the, uh, to these institutions. Uh- So I want to backtrack a little bit and zoom out because over the course of this conversation, um, we've alluded a lot to the idea of happiness, the idea of human flourishing. And you say in your op-ed in the New York Times that you teach a constructively countercultural way of thinking about happiness. And so I guess I want to ask you to unpack that for me a little bit um, because I think certainly in secular culture, happiness is the point of life. That's kind of taken as a given. Um, And you previously referred to it as human flourishing. So I guess, first, I want to say, are those the same thing? And second, is happiness actually the point of life? And then along the way, when our culture discusses happiness, where are we going wrong? Why does the way that you instruct happiness have to be countercultural? So I think when... um... When we talk about happiness, uh, I think we often are talking about something that is probably similar to what we mean by happiness, but with a decisive difference, right? So we tend to think that um, happiness is when everything is going well for you, when you're just you know, receiving honors or money or just, you know, things are, things are, are going your way. Uh, probably because in English, anyway, the, the root of the word happiness comes from chance or luck, right? It has a lot to do with external goods. Mm. Um, and I think in, in tandem with that, we, we tend to encourage a view of, of flourishing or happiness in our students that uh, we've described as a kind of uh, life of an expert dabbler, maybe a Renaissance man or woman updated, right? Um, someone who's aware of all sorts of different things, all sorts of different fields, all sorts of different perspectives, all sorts of different ways of life, and isn't particularly attached to any one of them, um, but is kind of somewhat at home in all of them. That's, um, I, we, we think that kind of understanding of happiness or the ideal form of life is not the deepest kind of happiness, in part because we take our understanding of happiness more from a kind of Aristotelian um, perspective, which is Happiness is the, the activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. And, and by that, he is getting us to think about how you, uh, yeah, how you flourish, but how you operate, how you work, what it is that you're doing. So I think where it comes akin to our sense of like everything going right is when I think you're, you're happy in an Aristotelian sense, when you're doing what you were meant to do mm-hmm. and you feel almost as if time is suspended because you're, you're, you're in the moment of engaging in that activity that you were meant to engage in, and you're doing it very well, virtuously or excellently. So in that sense, it's somewhat similar, but it's decisively different because that kind of happiness, that kind of activity, can't be found by someone who has trained themselves to be an expert dabbler, who is somewhat familiar with all sorts of different things, but really not deeply engaged, not, not in any one of them, who hasn't decided to commit his life or her life to one particular path, to one particular kind of excellence. Um, And so the form of happiness that Aristotle recommends is really quite at odds with the kind of happiness we implicitly train students to achieve. Let me just add uh, one quick note on this, which is there's this this famous remark of Nietzsche's, Annika, that's a little bit uh, akin to your question. Nietzsche says, it's not true that all men want happiness. He says, only Englishmen want that. <laughs> and it's funny, but it's, it's also, uh, it's also uh, false even in its basic formulation because this all men desire happiness, that's not an English observation. That's an Aristotelian observation. It's, it's, it's a famous part of the beginning of the, um, of the Nicomachean ethics. And Aristotle was not an Englishman. And I think Aristotle's logic holds up to 
to any rational examination, what Aristotle basically tells us is that, look, there's lots of debate about the meaning of happiness. But with respect to all other goods, if you say to somebody with respect to, let's say, a car or pleasure, if you say to somebody, why do you want a car? They will say, because it will make me happy. They might be wrong about that, but that is a that is a it's not a logically uh, uh, senseless answer. If you say to them, why do you want pleasure? They will also say, because that will make me happy. If you say, why do you want virtue? You might also say, because that will make me happy. But if you say, I want happiness, people don't ask you why you want that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, uh, and and it, it's sensible because happiness, you know, while, this, while we have lots of debate about the meaning of this word, and we should have debate about the meaning of this word, it is the word that people use to indicate the end of human life, the thing for which our, at which our striving aims. That's what we mean by um, by the kind of happiness that we're um, that we're looking for, and in a sense, uh, you know, I I would be I, I would like to know, you know, if I could spell out Nietzsche's position a little bit further. What does he think we pursue uh, that's not happiness, and why do we pursue that? Isn't he going to wind up saying, "Oh, well, we pursue power or creativity or whatever it is that that or experience, whatever it is that he's he's got in mind"? Isn't he going to wind up saying that we that we pursue those things because we think they're going to make us happy? I think he might. So I guess, and again, kind of zooming out, thank you for that. That was really interesting and instructive. Uh, But I guess zooming out a little bit from that. So in your last book, you laid out kind of these two thinkers, Montaigne and Pascal, and they both have very different ideas. Your last book was about restfulness, about what it's like to be restful. And I don't want to spill the beans too much, but I know that you're currently kind of thinking a lot about the sort of next step concept, the concept of choice. And so, I mean... Maybe I shouldn't assume that you're looking at these two thinkers, but um, when you look at those two thinkers, they had very different ideas about restfulness. Do they also have very different ideas about choice? Yes. (laughs) That's a a really interesting uh, uh, way of looking at this. Uh, I want to begin by by saying that that what what we're really interested in um, in uh, Why We Are Restless is less rest than restlessness. And, but you're right that Montaigne and Pascal conceive of restlessness differently. Uh, Montaigne thinks we're naturally restless and we need to learn to be at home. Pascal thinks we're naturally restless and that restlessness is the core of what we are. Famously says, man transcends man. That is, and what he means is that we cannot be at home in this world. And we think that Pascal's understanding of this is truer to the human condition. Now, with respect to choice, the other part of your question, I think Montaigne thinks we can make whatever choices we want as long as we don't take any of them too seriously. And, but it seems to us that that is, I mean, we understand and appreciate why Montaigne said that when he said it. Um, He was living in the midst of religious war, he, he thought his friends and neighbors took themselves too seriously, and this is why they're all killing each other. And so he urged them to tone it down. And that's a that's an entirely understandable, in some ways, admirable uh, thing to do. But um, his his world is not our world, and his problems are not our problems. And for us, I think the problem looks different and even opposed to that. Um, and here, what I mean is that you know when Pascal says. Look, we are looking for a transcendent good. When he says that, look, the 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 the, the void in the human heart is just this vast longing that could only be answered or filled by a good that is literally infinite. Um, he's setting out a standard by means of which we can really rank and discriminate among the various things that we choose in our lives. And that we think is the thing that we're missing is that, you know, I think this is the, I think this is the experience that that might've been the experience of of somebody like yourself is like, look, I've got all these talents. I've cultivated all these kinds of things. I've got lots of opportunities in front of me and I have no idea whether it's better to be an organic farmer or a high school teacher. The, um, and I, uh, you know, I have, and I have no idea how to, how to size that up. And so, this is the kind of principle of choice that we want to we want to teach, and you know I think there's a a sense that 
and I, I think it's important to see that it's not just that Montaigne, the problems of Montaigne's time are not the problems of our time. It's that this kind of decayed Montaigneanism, the um, this this restless sense of lack of direction in our world, opens the soul profoundly to a an uninstructed and dangerous uh, longing for authority. Hmm. People have no idea what to do with themselves, and they frankly just want to be told, want to be bossed around, want to be directed this way or that way because they find the pressure of choice just too much. And so you can see this this profound craving for authority on both the left and the right right now. One of the interesting things about it is that it's totally irrational. Actually, I want to make a distinction there. I think um, you see this most prominently on the left. And I think you see clearly, uh, particularly on campus right now, that people on the left are advocating uh, very strenuously for justice and uh, as they see justice. And there's, and I want to say that there's nothing wrong with a desire for justice in and of itself. Some people think that you know justice is the wrong aim, aim on campus. And I, I don't think that's right. Justice is a natural human concern and people are right to be concerned with it. But what one notices is that the standards shift with astonishing rapidity, which indicates that they weren't that well thought through in the first place. So one can see this in the move from the arguments that were made about gay marriage to the arguments that are made about transgenderism. I don't, I'm not trying to take a position on those arguments at the moment, but I just want to point out the way in which the profound shift that happened there. The one argument was, uh, kind of uh, Lady Gaga born this way argument, right? Like this is th this is what nature has made me and you have to respect that. The other argument is nature is not dispositive with respect to human sexuality. The same people who are making the one argument a few years ago, or many of the same people, not all of them, many of the same people who are making the one argument a few years ago are now making the opposite argument without recognizing anything of the tension there and doing both with the same kind of zeal. And so, you know, that to me indicates that people are more interested in conviction um, than they are in the actual convictions for which uh, they are they are standing. Now, on the right, I think this is a little bit different in the sense that the longing for authority is often tied to uh, explicit uh, religious attachments, and there, I think people can be uh, more discerning, and often are. It is the case that sometimes, you know, there, there, there are some people who, again, we have, we have some sympathies with who are interested in the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church, for example, for the tiaras. <laughs> in other words, they, you know, they like these things precisely because they are showy and anti-modern. The, um, that's not the same thing as working through the theology and, or working or simply reading the Gospels and, and, and figuring out what is this thing that is being proposed to me? Do I believe it and why? But a lot of people are actually doing that kind of work. And, you know, in that sense, I don't want to condemn the desire for authority as such. That desire has a proper place, but it has to be a discerning desire. Mm. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting. So then I guess to to summarize your view on authority, we do need authority, but through our education, when we're confronted with a lack of tools, we don't have the requisite ability to make choices. And as a result, we have a craving because we believe that authority in silencing our ability to make choices will provide us kind of with at least some constancy and some security, I guess, some confidence that we're doing the right things in our lives. Is that the argument? Yeah, let me, I think I can lay out a couple of different um ways of thinking about authority. Uh, so one, and this is a, a negative sense of authority, is uh, Tocqueville points out that people in democratic societies do not tend to bow to the authority of the past. They tend to bow to the authority of the crowd. Mm. And he says that there's, there's a tendency in the human soul to attribute authority to that which oppresses one. In other words, it, we, we take the crowd to be right, not in spite of the fact that it 
that it oppresses us, but because of the fact <laughs> that it oppresses us, the I mean, it makes us it makes us feel better about our endurance of oppression. So in the in the in the, in the present cancel culture moment, lots of people get pushed along by a crowd, and are they? I, I think they justify allowing themselves to be pushed around by that by saying, "Well, the crowd must be right." The uh, in other words, by 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 attributing authority to the crowd. And so that is merely a recognition of power. There's a different kind of, of turn toward authority that I think I can best, uh, I, I can give your, your, your listeners the best example of this by pointing them to a marvelous uh, talk given by uh, Anton Barbake, uh, a friend of ours and a former James Madison program uh, fellow, um, a few years ago when we were all there honoring our teacher, Leon Cass. And Anton did this marvelous reproduction of a Leon Cass class on the Gettysburg Address. And then in what was effectively like a, a letter to, to Leon, in fact, I think he might have been quoting from an actual letter that he wrote to Leon. He said, if you were a general, I'd enroll in your army. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, this is clearly a, a picture of, of recognizing uh, uh, Leon Cass as, as an authority. Now, uh, why? Uh, here I'll draw on my own experience with the same teacher, with, with, with Leon Cass. The thing is that he just had arguments for everything he thought. He, he had answers to every reasonable question that I could ask. And actually, if he didn't have an answer, he would tell you that. <laughs> the, um, and would say, like, well, well we got to think about that some more. And then, interestingly, he would go away and think about it and come back the next week. And you'd forgotten the question that you asked, but he hadn't. The, um, and would, would, would give you an answer to it. And so, you know, there you sometimes find in life, and you find this in people, you find it in books, this person has thought through the question I care about much further than I have. And I don't understand everything he's saying at the moment, but I understand enough to see that this is way better than anything I have. And, uh, and every time I ask it a question, it gives, me a, it gives me something in response, even if that something is an I don't know, an honest I don't know on certain cases. And so you're willing to sort of take somebody extra seriously, to listen to, what, to their direction. The um, as to your life. That's a different kind of authority. And that's an authority that you have actually tested with the force and freedom of your own mind. The, um, that kind of, uh, that kind of um, uh, respect for authority we think is entirely justified. It's the other kind that really gets out of hand. Yes. And I think to bring this back to the question of choosing, right? When you're, when you're not, when you don't feel confident about your own choices, when you don't feel like those choices have been uh, thought through when you don't feel like they've been done according to a certain kind of method, right? Then you're reaching for authority out of a sense of helplessness and lack, right? So there's a proper place for authority in human life, I think we would both say. But uh, it's it, it becomes a kind of dangerous situation when you have people just reaching for authority for authority's sake without any sense of why that authority needs to be in place in this particular time, in this particular way. And for a particular end, right? So I think the the importance of thinking about the art of choosing is we've concentrated so far mostly on the personal, right? Like what do you do when you're 22 and, you, and you're not sure what to do next with your life? But the problem is really a lot more, a lot more. It has a lot of social and political consequences as mm -hmm. well. And so we are nearing. I know that you guys have a time cap, and we are nearing that. Uh, but I guess I want to finish off uh, by asking, and I'm happy you brought up Tocqueville because he talks a lot about this, but asking about how your ideas kind of intersect with the democratic ideals that underpin um, underpin America and, and the American ethos. Um, because one might argue that kind of constant restlessness, constant exploration, um, and a preponderance of choices are in fact issues that are kind of endemic to the American system, to American democracy, to the American way of looking at the world. And that's not to say that I'm saying defend it right now, because obviously any system of government has, has its pros and cons. But I guess when you look at America and at the American system, how do you marry your ideas about the importance of taking rest, about the importance of not just focusing on quantity of choice, but rather on well thought out choices and the tools to make choices? 
um, and just your emphasis kind of on the contemplative life in general, how do you marry those ideas with the American character as articulated by Tocqueville? I think making well thought out choices that you have reasons for that you can express what it is you really care about you know, articulately to other people who might not care about that same thing is actually essential to Republican citizenship. So again, this art of choosing isn't something that's just important for you personally, although it is very important to you personally. But it's only when you have, as my husband said, the confidence that you've made a choice with the, the force and freedom of your own mind, right, um, that you can you can start to engage with other people who have made similar who've made choices in similar ways but come to different conclusions, right? So the whole art of conversation, of argument, of deliberation, of negotiation depends, first of all, on some the exercise of some kind of art of choosing on the individual level. Um, so I think the system of government that we have requires or even presupposes that people will have engaged in this before they come to the bargaining table, right? That, that allows them not to just reach for an authority arbitrarily but actually make a case for their own perspective and then listen well for someone else's perspective to see if they might come to a better understanding. Um, and then the other part of what you were talking about, uh, I think you were suggesting uh, that, okay, that might, that might be the, the system of government that we have set up, the system of, of interpersonal relations, but honestly, American life is and has always been very, very busy, yeah. right? And how do you learn the art of choosing if you're just always on the go? How can you do any of the things that we're that we're speaking of if if you're forced to earn a living and and keep running around to to maintain yourself uh, throughout your whole life? I think it's remarkable that Americans afford a good number of their young citizens the chance to think about what they're going to do with their lives before they do it. That's not everybody, but the fact that we have two or four year colleges for very good number of our citizens is an indicator that we think that time is really important, that we're willing to say to people, you should devote that much time, not to, not necessarily to career training, which, you know, say in, in Europe, they would be tracked much more quickly into a vocational path. Um, but for just taking this, this, this moment, this pause to think about it. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I think Annika, that, that there's a lot of deep seated and, um, and thoroughgoing discontent with our entire system of government, politics, everything right now. And so, you know, one sees this in the revolutionary language in the left, but increasingly also in the uh, post-liberal um, kind of language that we're um, we're seeing on the right. And insofar as people are saying that something is deeply wrong with their own lives and our order. I have a certain sympathy with these complaints on um, on both sides. Mm. However, I think it's very important to remember that our system of government should never be identified simply with Lockean liberalism. It wasn't that from the beginning. It has always been a Republican kind of political order. And the Republican kinds of political order require certain virtues, virtues of governing oneself and then the virtues that Aristotle identified with citizenship. That is uh, the capacity for ruling and being ruled in turn. And if we don't develop those capacities, which are a kind of mean, it's, a, you know, Aristotle's language is so interesting. He says, you know, the citizen virtue is the capacity to rule and be ruled in turn or in part is the other translation of, of, of a certain Greek word there. And so it's this, you know, this interesting double-sided thing, right? You're the kind of person who knows how to lead others, but you're also the kind of person that knows how to be led. What is that? I mean, I think that in part involves the capacity to listen when somebody else is making sense and to, and to follow along when they've made the best argument, but also the knowledge of how to give such a good argument yourself the, um, so as to bring others along with you. And if we look at what, what are the alternatives to that, well, we end up in a place that Plato described in between the, um, as he's describing the succession of regimes in Plato's Republic, he says, 
sometimes in describing the, the, the transition from democracy to tyranny, he says too much freedom leads to too much slavery. Mm. And, you know, he's just describing people who live profoundly disordered lives, who do not know which end is up, who cannot distinguish between, for example, necessary and unnecessary pleasures. And next thing you know, those people are in the, um, in the train of a tyrant. And I think we can look around and see that this phenomenon is not so foreign to um to the world that we um that we observe around us and so you know the what we're saying in arguing for the recovery of the ability of rational self command and choice is not at all an anti democratic anti republican anti american argument it's in a way a very old american argument the you know the the the, the generations uh, that helped build up our political system and that includes many generations a lot of these people knew that you just couldn't treat the, the American system of government as some kind of self-contained system. They were drawing on all kinds of other resources, yeah. biblical resources, classical resources. We think that we need to remember those resources again if we're going to make our own system of uh, of, of self-government work, the um, and that that is the, actually those those resources external to America have always been part of the American system in this sense. There's nothing more American than combining the ancient and the modern, which is what Jen and I are arguing to do. Amazing. What a fantastic note to end on. Really super thought-provoking about the the purposes of liberal education and what it means to choose and when liberty is good and when, according to Plato, it, it is just confusing. So I really appreciate you taking the time, Ben and Jenna. Super, super great to have you on the show. Thanks, Annika. Really enjoyed being there. And and hello to everybody at the James Madison program, a place that uh, we were fellows there a while ago. And remember, with the greatest of fondness. Well, there you have it, Madisonians. Ben and Jenna Story on how the university is and is not teaching us how to deal with restlessness and make choices. Don't forget to follow us. And if the spirit moves, leave us a rating or review. Our website is jmp.princeton.edu. Our Twitter handle is at Madison Program, and you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time here on Madison Sports.